Hello everybody, it's Margaret here with Free Tours by Foot, and today we're going to take a virtual tour of De Wallen, the red light district of Amsterdam. This tour will bring you through the largest and oldest of Amsterdam's three red light districts, which also happens to be where the city began. It's a place where churches, brothels, palaces, canals, and cannabis dens, all the extremes of this versatile city, live side by side. We're beginning our tour in Dam Square, named for a dam in the Amstel River that was built at this site, giving the city its name, Amsteller Dam, or Amsterdam. The dam was built in 1270 and was the starting point of Amsterdam's history. The Amstel River used to run through this square we're standing in, but eventually this part of the river was filled in. Today, the water disperses between the neighborhood's canals. Because of the river, trade in the area first gathered around this spot, and so this square became the home of markets and the seat of government. Today's seat of government, the Royal Palace, was completed in 1655, although it's only been the Royal Palace since 1808. Before that, it was the City Hall. It's both a visual and an engineering marvel, with a stone structure all dependent on thousands of wooden pilings sunk into the wetland soil underneath. It dates from a time when Amsterdam was the center of business, technology, and art in Europe, the Dutch Golden Age. The people of the Netherlands had just successfully overthrown the Spanish kings who ruled them, and they created the Dutch Republic in 1588, well before the better-known American and French revolutions. This period brought about many of the Netherlands' most famous contributions to history. It saw the careers of native-born artists like Rembrandt and Vermeer or scientists like Antony van Leeuwenhoek. And Holland also became a temporary home to thinkers from other parts of Europe who found a freer climate for expression here than where they came from. This was also the era of the Dutch Empire, with its navigators, cartographers, and businessmen. 17th century Amsterdam became the home of the first stock exchange and of the largest company in the world, which obtained and managed colonial holdings and trade from North America all the way to Japan. And all that was happening in a city with a tiny, crumbling town hall. An upgrade was in order. So they made this, the largest building in Europe that wasn't a church, a title it held on to well into the 19th century. Perched at the top of the building, in the center, you can see a bronze statue of peace. In one hand, she's holding an olive branch. In the other, she holds a staff of mercury, a symbol of the maritime trade that made the prosperity of that period and therefore this building, possible. Today, the Netherlands have a king, currently Willem Alexander, who took over from his mother in 2013. Monarchy had returned to the Netherlands in the form of Louis-Napoleon Bonaparte, brother of Napoleon Bonaparte, in 1806. He made the old city hall his personal residence, and for today's constitutional monarchs, it's one of three royal palaces, this one is mostly used for state visits. It's open to the public on the weekends, and you can explore a number of the rooms inside, like the Great Hall you see here. Just to the right of the Royal Palace sits the Nieuwe Kerk, or the New Church. It's new because it was completed in 1408, compared with the Oude Kerk, built in the early 1200s, which we'll see later. The new church was built when the old church became too small for the growing population of the city. It isn't actively used as a church today, apart from serious state functions like royal investitures, Holland's version of a coronation, and wedding ceremonies. Since 1979, it's been the home of a cultural foundation, the National Foundation of the New Church, which organizes exhibitions and concerts held inside the building. With the palace and the church behind us, we'll now make our way over to the other side of Dam Square to see the National Monument. Somebody's having a good time today? Why not? The National Monument is a cenotaph, an empty tomb, representing Dutch people killed during the multiple wars, and it's a gathering point on the annual Remembrance Day of May 4th. But the monument's beginning was World War II. This spot was witness to some of the last Dutch casualties of the Second World War. 
After the German surrender, as Amsterdamers were gathering in the square to celebrate, a group of Nazis mounted a machine gun on a balcony and fired into the crowd, injuring or killing more than a hundred people. Not long after, in 1945, a temporary monument was placed here, which included 12 urns containing soil from war cemeteries and execution grounds where Dutch people had died during the war. By the time the present monument was complete in 1956, those 12 urns were incorporated into the low wall that stands on one side. The relief on the column portrays the hardship of the war years. The statues to either side represent the different portions of Dutch society that participated in the anti-Nazi resistance, and the statue above signifies the peace and potential that came after victory. This monument is also worth remembering, as this is where a number of walking tours in Amsterdam begin, including the free ones. We'll provide a link to our website below, so you can check them out yourself. So, the things we've seen so far are some of the least red-lit elements of the Red Light District. Dam Square actually falls along the edge of the Wallen. This area gets called the Palace Quarter, a name that helps it maintain a separate reputation from the area we'll be visiting next. Another name that does the same job is the Red Carpet, a nickname for the corridor that includes Damrock and Rokin Streets, the ones that follow the old route of the river. They, and some of the other streets here that surround the palace, are home to upscale hotels and shops, and at one time, the Bank of the Netherlands and the world's first stock exchange were located on these streets. If you play Monopoly in Dutch, the most expensive street is Kalverstraat, the one that runs right in front of the palace. Compared to all this luxury, we're in for a change of scene as we go toward the heart of de Wallen. Amsterdam in general, and the Red Light District in particular, are famous for the things you can do, and for those who aren't used to those freedoms, it's easy to think that anything goes here. But there are rules, which are worth knowing for the sake of the neighborhood's residents and your fellow travelers, as well as to avoid fines and unnecessary risks. While cannabis and alcohol are both easy to find in this neighborhood, it isn't legal to consume either one outside, and walking around under the heavy influence of either one can have consequences too. Sex work is legal, but taking pictures of sex workers is strongly frowned upon. For this reason, there'll be a few streets I won't be able to show you, and we'll mark those ones out on a map. Nothing says red light district like a boutique condom shop. You'll see a frankness and positivity about sex here. Think cute, smiling condom mascots. That's par for the course in this neighborhood. De Wallen's sex trade has been part of the area for centuries, off and on, it gravitated towards this area by way of trends that operate worldwide. Harbors bring sailors and other short-term residents to a city, and supply centers around demand. And with the business of sex work comes other peripheral trades, like condom sales. The full name of this shop is Condomerie Het Gulden Vliese, or the Golden Fleece Condom Shop. It opened in 1987 with a mission in mind. The AIDS crisis was underway, and access to and good information about condoms could save lives. And after the store opened, two women from the team became the public face so as to work against the idea that HIV was a problem that only concerned gay men. Easy honesty is the policy here. Employees are trained and ready to have an unabashed conversation about customers' specific needs in terms of fit, allergy, personal taste, and more something you can't expect from typical pharmacy clerk. And since these kinds of conversations can make customers nervous, the atmosphere is deliberately lighthearted. Besides the satisfied-looking condoms painted all over the walls, there's also a giant tie-dye one suspended from the ceiling, and the inventory includes novelty condoms shaped like animals. But basic, functional ones are available too, along with lubricants and some gift items. If store clerks who can cheerfully discuss condom fitting seems at all surprising, spare a thought for Dutch lawmakers. Where some legal codes in Europe and its colonies rely on blanket euphemisms like, quote, crime against nature to describe and condemn whole swaths of sexual behavior, the Netherlands regulates the sex trade, and its legislative proceedings cover subjects that would earn a ban from TV in other countries. We'll have more on Holland's legal novelties just ahead as we passed our first smart shop, our next stop. 
In just a few moments, we're going to take a right turn down a narrow alleyway. As we do, if you look up, you'll notice large beams jutting out from the tops of the buildings. Each of these beams has a hook on the end of it, and this is one of the most unique features you'll find on buildings in Amsterdam. Here we go. Look to the top there. See the beams? Most original structures here have narrow, steep, and often winding staircases, which makes it borderline impossible to bring large, heavy, or bulky objects to the top floor. So for centuries, houses here were built with hooks jutting out from the top. Here's a picture of an older one. So goods could be lifted straight from the street, or the canal, to the upper floor windows, a method still widely practiced today. And our next stop is just to head up here on the left where the lit sign is. This is a smart shop. You'll find quite a few in Devalin, carrying smoking paraphernalia, lots of items you might see in a health food store in another country, and growing materials for Netherlands residents wanting to grow their own cannabis, which is legal, up to five plants per person. The neon sign on this particular smart shop advertising magic mushrooms is a little misleading, Places like this can sell some naturally occurring mind-altering substances like peyote, mescaline, sylvia, ayahuasca, and magic fungi, but not magic mushrooms. As of 2008, they're categorized alongside cocaine, LSD, and other hard drugs as serious public health risks after one too many incidents of a hallucinating tourist having an accident. But the specific wording of the law left out what are commonly called truffles, underground fungi with the same active ingredient and similar effects to their mushroom counterparts. This technology is a good example of the complexity of regulating drugs, and there's no question that absolute prohibition is simpler, but the philosophy guiding Dutch law around drugs is that absolute prohibition puts the whole market in the hands of illegal dealers, and if low-risk drugs like cannabis are sold by the same dealers who traffic in cocaine and heroin, buyers are likelier to find their way toward the more harmful stuff. And so, with the substances it categorizes as, quote, soft drugs, Holland takes a harm reduction approach, much like what you'd see for alcohol in many countries. Only certain ages can buy it, only certain places can sell it, and lots of other controls besides. And cannabis is, in fact, illegal in Holland. It just isn't criminally punished below certain quantities, or under certain sales conditions, which we'll see soon. I'd prefer to walk down the alleyway parallel to this one, but out of respect to the workers there, I won't take the camera. Called Dolabayanestej, that alleyway is dotted with the namesake red lights above the windows and doors. This is one form sex work can legally take in Holland. It's restricted to certain streets and certain neighborhoods, including most streets in this one. A prospective client can approach the door, and the woman behind can open the door to discuss prices and services. A closed shade means the room is in use. A red light over the window indicates a cisgender woman, blue lights indicate transgender women. Male sex workers tend to operate online, outside the legal framework, and, as of 2020, there's only one all-male brothel in the city. Like I mentioned earlier, legal, or at least unpunished sex work, has a much longer history in Devalin than legal drugs do. From the Middle Ages through the Dutch Golden Age, policy was often extreme punishment, while practice was often to turn a blind eye. And even the law sometimes opted to regulate rather than forbid, as it did under Louis Napoleon, when the health of military men was a major concern for the occupying French government. The early 20th century saw a swing back toward criminalization, but as of 2000, the law recognizes sex workers as a legitimate part of the workforce. Exactly what that means has continued to change. In 2020, Amsterdam banned guided tours in Devalen from passing by the windows, a measure meant to minimize the staring and photo-taking sex workers endure while they work. Overall, though, the current system is, like the rules around drugs, mainly about harm reduction. Legalization and regulation, the notion goes, help to separate consensual sex work by people who have chosen it as a career from the kind of international human trafficking that exists outside the law in cities around the world. The same law that legalized sex work in 2000 also increased penalties for coercing someone into it, and shutdowns of illegal prostitution operations aren't uncommon in Amsterdam. 
Now we turn left to walk along the canal toward our next stop, the Bulldog. Right before the Bulldog, on the left-hand side, you'll see the entrance to the Dolabayanan stage, just there. This is a coffee shop in the Dutch sense of the term, meaning a place that sells small amounts of cannabis. That's separate from a coffee house or a cafe where you actually buy coffee. This one is the oldest coffee shop in the country, and its founder, Hank de Vries, is responsible for the potentially confusing choice of names. He chose coffee shop for the ambience it suggested, a cosmopolitan place to meet, hang out, and talk. The name the bulldog came from his pet at the time. There's an often told legend of his start in this industry. In 1970, he visited one of those classic booming centers of cannabis demand, a music festival, and he brought a small amount of the stuff for himself and his friends. When others asked to buy it off him, he left the festival to fetch more and brought it back in matchboxes for easy sale. When cops gave him a hard time, the manager of the festival spoke up for him and announced his location to the entire crowd, and the police backed down. Cannabis was illegal at the time, but a culture of soft enforcement made it possible to just persuade the police to leave a dealer alone. A few years later, when he opened this business, the law hadn't changed, but Hank de Vries counted on that same permissiveness to keep his new enterprise from going under. For a while, the place was raided regularly. Hank instituted a policy that whenever a customer was picked up by police and had their purchase taken away, he'd replace it. While the business was running, Dutch law changed to list cannabis as a softer drug to decriminalize possession of small amounts and to allow establishments like his to sell it under highly regulated conditions. If you go inside, you'll see those regulations in action. As of 2020, quote, small amounts means under 5 grams, so that's the maximum purchase per person and the most that it's legal to carry with you. It's meant to be consumed on the property, and they aren't allowed to sell alcohol or tobacco or other drugs. And customers must be 18 or older. A more recent national law makes it illegal to sell to non-locals, but regions can opt out of enforcing it, and Amsterdam has done so, so you'll only run into this restriction if you visit certain other less touristic Dutch cities. And one more thing, it's illegal to advertise cannabis, so if you visit one of these establishments, you have to ask for the menu. In addition to the hard legal rules, there are also the soft cultural norms of how these places work. When you order cannabis, you can ask for it loose or pre-rolled. They do sell other things than cannabis, food and non-intoxicating drinks, and it's standard to buy something that's not meant for smoking. And a skilled employee at a good Dutch coffee shop should be like a skilled barista at a cafe, knowledgeable about the place's inventory and able to make tailored suggestions based on a customer's tastes. Another point in common between coffee shops and cafes, connoisseurs of the product tend to turn their noses up at chains and opt for a little neighborhood joint instead. Pun not intended. And the Bulldog is not a little neighborhood joint. Hank de Vries has expanded his business a lot over time, and he's got locations all across the city and internationally, including coffee shops, bars, gift shops, and hotels. Tourism is his corner, and most residents are happy to leave his business to that clientele. Now we'll head further down the canal to the Cannabis College. Yes, really. There's where we came from, and here is the college. At Cannabis College, you can find the same easygoing, informative attitude we saw earlier at the Condomery. It's a non-profit information center, free to enter, and operating since 1997. As far as what you'll find inside, there's a publicly accessible library of cannabis-related material, ranging from informative to entertaining. They offer testing services to determine the chemical makeup of a cannabis sample. You can take a quiz and receive a cannabis diploma. They offer workshops to train coffee shop staff and non-professional enthusiasts. And they maintain an indoor garden, where growers can talk shop about nutrients, pest preservation, and anything a different kind of gardener might think about for roses or petunias. Like I mentioned, current law allows possession of five plants, so the garden here consists of five very large plants only. Just two buildings further down, we'll find one of the two locations of the Hash, Marijuana, and Hemp Museum. You can see the name along the side of the building here. 
This museum consists of two buildings, located a short walk apart from each other. The first one you'll find is the Hemp Gallery, while the other, part of the museum and its original home since 1987, is six buildings further down the block, again with the name over the door. That part of the museum covers the history of cannabis consumption, as seen through art, culture, science, business, religion, law, and medicine. You'll see exhibits about popular misconceptions, smoking devices from many times and places, and again, live plants. Tickets are 9 euro. Audio guides are available for free and are an essential aid to understanding the museum. Of course, there's no denying that Amsterdam wouldn't be remotely the city it is today without the cannabis plant, not just because of its mind-altering uses, but because it was critical to the creation of the Dutch Empire. Certain types of the plant produce some of the toughest natural fibers in the world, used in clothing, modern plastics, and the rigging of ships. And ahead, we'll see the historic home of maybe the largest consumer of hemp in the Dutch Golden Age, the Dutch East India Company. To get there, we're going to walk down this street, known as Oude Hoogstraat, or Old High Street, which has been a shopping street for centuries. This street was also home to the headquarters of the Dutch East India Company, a behemoth of a building we'll be seeing shortly. However, it's also home to the smallest house in Amsterdam, right here, number 22 Oude Hoogstraat. Historically, property in Amsterdam was taxed based on frontage space, so the narrower your building, the less tax you had to pay, which explains the very tall, narrow buildings associated with the city. Number 22, therefore, would have paid the lowest amount of frontage tax possible, being only 2.02 meters, or 6.5 feet wide, and 5 meters, or 16.5 feet deep. The curious little building next to it is the gateway to Walloon Church. The work of architect Hendrik de Kaiser, it served as a passageway for funeral services, as you can see here in this drawing from 1768. You can see number 22 next to it, However, at that point, it had only one floor. We're just a few steps away from our next stop, which is right here. In Dutch, you'll see this company referred to as the Verenigde Oostindische Company, or United East India Company. In English, it's usually called the Dutch East India Company to distinguish it from the English East India Company. While the English company came first, the Dutch company surpassed it by pretty much every other measure. We'll refer to it by its Dutch initials, the VOC. You see these three letters on nearly anything the company created. They were the central element of one of the world's first corporate logos. The company also had its own flag. It operated military and local governments, and it was the first company to officially issue shares to the public. In many ways, it was a predecessor to the huge multinational corporations of today, with monopoly power and the backing of the Dutch government. The building gives you a sense of the scale of the VOC, especially compared with the narrow buildings that are the norm in Amsterdam. Over the course of its life, the VOC became larger than any company that had ever existed before it. It was created in 1602 through a government-forced merger of several competing companies, all of which dealt in resources from various parts of Asia, especially spices. Pepper, cloves, nutmeg, and other products of the Far East were in high demand in Europe, and lives were risked, lost, and in many cases intentionally ended in pursuit of the potential profits. Before the VOC, the companies that went adventuring for a cargo of spices were short-lived, just long enough to finance a single expedition. Failure on these expeditions was deadly, and success could be almost as bad. If too many succeeded at once, then supply might outpace demand, prices would drop, and all the risk was for nearly nothing. The solution of the day was government-controlled monopolies, which could steer supply in such a way as to keep prices steady and profits high. Acquiring shiploads of spices came with another problem. Europeans didn't have much that Asians of the era wanted to trade for. So companies like the VOC either took control of or obliterated local power structures, sometimes driving out or exterminating a local population to build plantations on their land. 
They also aimed to control production in multiple parts of Asia so they could use intra-Asian trade to their advantage. The VOC found its way to sending many of these goods home, selling silk, coffee, and porcelain in Dutch ports. In the areas it controlled, the VOC had the ability to install leaders, hold trials, and execute those it found guilty, as well as declare war. VOC colonies, and those controlled by its smaller counterpart, the Dutch West India Company, came to form the Dutch Empire, spreading the Dutch language and Dutch names around the world. A tiny VOC-held island off Nagasaki was the exclusive point of contact between Europe and Japan for more than 200 years. South Africa became a point at which Dutch ships resupplied, and the Afrikaans language is a close relative of Dutch. New Zealand is named for Zeeland, a Dutch province, Tasmania for a Dutch navigator, and Dutch explorers were the first Europeans to chart much of the Australian coast. Add in the West India Company, and there are even more, Dutch Suriname in South America, plus lots of Dutch place names in a certain part of the northeastern US like Harlem, Staten Island, and even the Hudson Bay. English explorer Henry Hudson was employed by the Dutch West India Company, and, in fact, what turned New Amsterdam into New York was a trade. Holland gave it up to the English in exchange for an English-held nutmeg-producing island in the Pacific. But forces both inside and outside weakened the VOC. It didn't win all the wars it waged in Asia, and it made lasting enemies, not to mention competition from other European powers. And with unprecedented power placed in the hands of the company's directors, there were almost no controls on poor management or corruption here in Amsterdam. The VOC's history is full of firsts, and one of them, in 1622, was the first time shareholders rebelled against management. Owners of shares in the VOC protested two straight decades of no transparency from the company's directors, and it's claimed the account books had been smeared with bacon and fed to dogs. Such practices seem to have gotten worse with time, and in 1799, with its days of enormous profits long behind it, the company was finally dissolved. Its legacy is a complicated one. Its business and accounting practices, those not fed to dogs at least, are still studied today. The company's activities also led to the famous extinction of the dodo and the eradication or enslavement of multiple civilizations worth of people. Now we'll walk along the largest canal on our tour. It's called the Cloveniers Bergfall. All the canals have names that can tell you something about their history. The two canals we crossed earlier, for example, are called Oudezedsvoer Bergfall and Oudezeds Achter Bergfall. You may have noticed some similarities between Dutch and English, and here the parts all relate to the English words. The Bergval part that's in all three names means a city wall. Oudezeds means on the old side, meaning the older part of the city, and Voer and Achter are related to for and after, meaning in front of and behind. So the Oudezeds Voorbergval and the Oudezeds Achterbergval were canals on the old side of the city that ran along the inner and outer city walls, or de Wallen. These canals served several purposes, but as the mention of walls suggests, defense was one of them. And the Cloveniersbergval was the same way. A Clovenier was a city guard, named for the gun called a clover that each one carried. A couple of notable buildings stand on either side of this canal. The first one, which is to our right, is called the Trippenhaus. Firstly, it stands out because it's a lot bigger than most buildings in Amsterdam, and it has a long classical stone facade. Today it's the home of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, but the facade is still the one chosen by the Tripp brothers, who built the mansion in 1662. They were arms dealers, so their preferred design features decorative cannons on the pediment, the wide triangle-shaped area at the top and center of the building's front, plus chimneys shaped like huge ornamented mortars and a gunpowder color over the whole building. It's the largest residence in Amsterdam, though, to be fair, there's a dividing wall down the center, and each brother only got half. Local popular legend has it that someone, either griping or gushing about the Tripp brothers' wealth, wished aloud that they could have a house as wide as just the front door of the Trippenhaus. 
you can see the result on the opposite side of the canal at number 26, a house less than two and a half meters wide. It's painted white with an awning on the ground floor, and it's home to a lingerie shop. The older canals in the heart of Dabalin were dug gradually as the medieval city grew. And then, as we discussed back in Dam Square, the city experienced explosive growth during the 17th century, the Dutch Golden Age. This was when most of Amsterdam's modern canals were built, as part of one enormous design. If you look at a map of the city, you'll see that most of the canals are part of a clearly planned shape, a series of concentric half-circles radiating from around Dam Square, with straight lines extending out across them, like spokes of a wheel. These were dug, going from west to east, over less than a century. They're such a major feature of the city that about a quarter of the surface is water. Given how much ground they cover, the canals have been useful for transport as well as defense. Sometimes water offers the most direct way from place to place in Amsterdam, and with the area around Dam Square as the main port, the canals meant that goods could be moved straight from larger boats to smaller boats for delivery. Cars gave the canals some competition for a while, and a few canals were filled in to create highways, but it's a rare person who would say a highway is more beautiful than a canal, so today, Amsterdam actively discourages car use in the heart of the city, encouraging car owners to instead park outside the area and take advantage of public transport to get in. Another side effect of all that space the water takes up Inventive Amsterdammers, eager for whatever square footage they can get their hands on, have taken to living on the water. More than 2,000 houseboats occupy the city's canals, each one with a city-issued permit specifying where it can moor, and an address where mail can be delivered. Quite a few of those thousands of boats are available as lodgings for visitors, too. A few others stand out for their own reasons. One is a floating cat shelter, which welcomes visitors to adopt a cat, donate to their care, and just hang out. It's located near Amsterdam Central Station. Another boat operates as a museum, where a curious visitor can learn about the day-to-day -day elements of houseboat life. That one is located a short distance southwest of Dam Square. Another purpose the canals serve, they're key to Amsterdam maintaining a safe relationship with water. The name Netherlands gives a hint that the country is low elevated, and much of it is below sea level. There's a constant risk of flooding, which can be particularly disastrous in a dense city like Amsterdam. But when water does come into the city, whether in the form of rain or tides or a storm surge, the canals help by giving it a place to go. Rather than accumulating in places that are supposed to be dry, it gathers in places engineered to be wet. And keeping water in the city also keeps the ground from drying out, reducing sinkage. Amsterdam is still vulnerable to rising sea levels and water-related disasters, but the protections here, and in Holland generally, are some of the most effective in the world. And in this case, they date back to the medieval city. And finally, for both visitors and locals, the canals are a source of enjoyment. Boat tours along the canals are one of the most popular tourist activities, we have a blog post covering your options, which we'll link below. And the annual Pride Parade in early August takes the form of a boat parade along the canals. The least advisable form of canal entertainment is swimming. Once in a while you'll see someone do it, but it's technically illegal, and from a safety perspective, dangers range from the large, like passing boats, to the very small, like microorganisms. And maybe the biggest downside of the canals is that, to many people, they look like a giant public garbage can. And tossed out sex shop inventory isn't the worst of it. One of the things you're likeliest to find at the bottom of a canal is that beloved symbol of Amsterdam, the bicycle. Generally, they're a source of clean air, good times, and cardiovascular health, but they also end up in canals by the thousands. And rusty metal is not something you want to kick while taking a spontaneous swim. It's a water town, so you can find swimming spots without looking too far. This water is best admired from a bit of a distance. Our next stop is right behind us, the Vaag. Here's another case of Dutch words being related to English words. Vaag means way, and the brick building you can see up ahead with the pointed roof was a weighing house. It's the oldest secular building in Amsterdam, begun in 1488. 
While it's named for a specific purpose, it's been quite a few different things. First, it was built as one of the gates allowing passage through the city walls. For the most part, you can only see those walls today in the names and locations of certain canals, but this, one other gate, and a tower still remain. This gate was located on the Kloveniersberg Wall, for which the canal we just left behind was named. And, and Newmarked, where the Vag now stands, itself stands on a filled-in portion of that canal, which is also buried under part of the Vag, so looking at it today we miss out on some of its original height. That fill-in happened in the 17th century, when new walls were built further out from the expanding city, and the Vag was repurposed from a gate to a public weighing house. Here, in the days before widely agreed-upon standards for units of weight, city authorities could weigh goods to determine, among other things, how much a tax dealer owed for bringing them here. It was only natural for a market to spring up around the weighing house, and so Newmarked, which we've just walked through, came to be. The building also became home to several trade guilds in the 17th century. If you circle the building, you can see signs over three of the entrances indicating which trade occupied the portion that particular door led to. This one was for a painter's guild. Another one of these was a surgeon's guild, which used the lecture hall in the building's central tower as an anatomical theater. Back then, curious members of the public could watch the proceedings here for an admission fee. Today, you can get it for free by looking at a painting called The Anatomy Lesson by Rembrandt von Rijn. And there, in the painting, you'll see people from the time who paid more than the spectators did to have their faces included in the official document of this big event, and you'll also be seeing one of the early works that made the career of the great artist of Amsterdam. The Vogue lost its civic function in the early 19th century, and from there it had a revolving and often overlapping array of tenants. But it's been restored to its 17th century design, and you can experience it with the help of Indie Vogue, the restaurant and cafe located inside. They do lighting by candles in the evening, and otherwise make the most of the historical atmosphere, which you can get for the price of an upscale meal, or just a coffee or a drink. From here, we're going to make our way through Amsterdam's Chinatown, which sits on a street known as Zeedijk, just up ahead and to the right where the red umbrellas are. Zeedijk means sea dike, and the street follows the shape of the 13th century seawall that used to stand here. This is actually one of the oldest parts of Amsterdam. In the 16th century, it was the first street to have permanent street lights installed, and at the time, it was considered one of the most respectable places in the city to live. When a newer, nicer neighborhood, the Herringrochs, was built, the wealthy abandoned Zeedijk, and it soon became the center of nightlife for passing sailors. As we saw back at the VOC headquarters, the Netherlands has a long history with Asia, including China, but the Asian community in Amsterdam is newer, dating to the early 20th century. Despite being known as Chinatown, there's also a Vietnamese and Thai population here. Chinese residents have done their best to come up with street names that complement both the sound and the meaning of the Dutch street names, and the city has hung signs reflecting those names, but here and there you may notice where a non-Chinese speaking city official has mistakenly hung a sign upside down. Just up ahead and on the left is our next stop, the Fo Guangshan Temple. It's the largest traditional Buddhist temple in Europe. Elements of that traditional style include the three arched gate, a central arch for clergy, and two outer arches for lay people, and the figurines of creatures from the Chinese zodiac along the gate's roof. And inside, you'll find a statue of Guang Yin, the particular bodhisattva this temple is dedicated to, with her many arms symbolizing works of compassion. On the less traditional side, if you look to the left and right of the main building, you'll see twin structures, built as part of the temple complex, but combining traditional Chinese decoration with the basic shape of a Dutch townhouse. If you're curious to see inside the temple, visitors are welcome during open hours. The temple also organizes celebrations of Chinese holidays, which sometimes expand into the new market if a lot of space is needed. You can learn more about these and other events on their website, linked below. Look at the flag here on the right, with the three X's. Those are St. Andrew's crosses, also seen on the flag of Scotland, that represent St. Andrew, a fisherman who was a martyr on the cross in the first century. 
When Amsterdam was beginning life as a fishing village, his cross was adopted by the local fishermen, there's another one, to bring good luck. And some people still hang his flag today. We're heading back into the red light district, so I need to be careful where I film. This building is red light tax. A red light tax is just what it sounds like, a tax office for sex workers. And there's a demand. There's a large number of people in the profession, and they're expected to have a lot of skills and knowledge that have nothing to do with their on-the-job hours. Under current Dutch law, a sex worker has to secure a license, which among other things means she's 18 or older, and she's also required to report her income and pay taxes, including annual income tax and quarterly value added tax. She's her own small business, often without any business background. The laws are complicated. Sex workers can operate out of windows, from private clubs, or as escorts, or they can work out of a private home but only as long as there's only one person working there, and bookings can be made in advance, but not online. A sex worker who operates out of one of the windows rents the window for a shift, for something in the area of 100 to 150 euros, so she starts each day in the red, and the income she makes after that may well exceed that cost in some seasons, and barely break it in others. She has to weigh the costs and benefits of joining the local union, and, more than likely, She's navigating all those questions in a language that isn't her first. Most sex workers in Amsterdam are from outside the country. And sex work can come with its own special financial obstacles. Credit card transaction companies may decline to serve sex workers, and banks may refuse to accept large amounts of cash or decline to offer bank accounts at all. In the midst of so many challenges, good financial advice is priceless, and it keeps red light tax in business. Just down the canal from Red Light Tax, you'll find the Erotic Museum. Take a moment to appreciate the garish neon sign on this building. Then we look further up and a little right of the center, and you'll see a small relief plaque with a caption reading, God is mein Burke, God is my castle. This combo is classic to Wallen, and we're in for plenty more of it. As for the museum behind those signs, museum may be a misnomer. It's a collection of curiosities, better called art than anything. Erotic may also be a misnomer. Visitors tend to find it more funny than anything. Think ancient erotic art and vintage sex toys from various parts of the world, plus a topless Mona Lisa, a collection of drawings by John Lennon, and a room decorated like Alice in Wonderland, where you can watch a sexualized Snow White cartoon. Reviews are mixed, but if you enjoy some silly fun mixed with a few moments of genuine intrigue, this place can meet those expectations. A bit further down is Red Light Secrets. Red Light Secrets is a museum about sex work, located in a former brothel. It includes the whole operation, from the bedrooms to spaces equipped for S&M, to the office, to the red-lit windows, to the lost and found, where customers left behind items like dentures, back when the brothel was still in business. Your exploration of the museum is guided by 12 audio stories, first-person accounts from sex workers about their time on the job. The idea is to put you as much on the inside of the experience as possible. The museum promises that you'll, quote, discover what you would look like if you were a sex worker. And, in fact, you can have your picture taken in one of the red light windows, the only place in the neighborhood that allows them. Another popular feature is a confessional, where visitors can write down fantasies or embarrassing secrets, with the possibility that they'll be posted on the museum's Instagram page, anonymously, of course. The picture the place paints is fun and frank, but not rosy or naive. There's also a memorial area, with dedications to sex workers who have been killed on the job. Just behind us, and across the canal, you can see the Kirk, where we are heading, to get there, we're going to cross a bridge, of course, as you have to do to get through the city. In fact, Amsterdam is home to more bridges than any other city in the world. Yes, even Venice. It is sometimes referred to as, quote, the Venice of the North, for this very reason. Venice boasts 400 or so bridges, but Amsterdam is home to well over 1,200, crossing the 165 canals that run through the city. In addition to that claim to fame, Amsterdam boasts the most cyclists per capita, with cycling accounting for 48% of all journeys made in the city. Indeed, there are more bikes in Amsterdam than people. 
With a population of around 800,000, there are approximately 1.2 million bicycles to be found here. Here you can see the church, but first I want to show you a unique Amsterdam feature. Just over here, it's called a pea curl. This is a typical example of a pea curl, a mid-19th century designer space for public urination, conceived in a time when they didn't need to accommodate throngs of visitors, just the occasional outdoor city worker. For what was needed then, this type isn't badly designed. From above, it's shaped like a letter G, with the entrance on one side and the business end on the other. It provided the necessary level of privacy, and no more, the notion being that visibility would minimize the chance of them being used for sex or drugs. As uncomfortable as they may be, pea curls have been saving lives since they were first built. From the mid-19th century to now, it's been common for men out on the town to find themselves in need of relief, but far from home. And in those circumstances, it's tempting to resort to what Amsterdamers call, quote, wild peeing, that is, using the canals for one of their oldest purposes. Besides being illegal, wild peeing is dangerous. A few people drown in the canals every year, and inevitably, a portion of that number is men with their pants unzipped. A pea curl may not be inviting, but it's better than death. But, whether it's a party or save from drowning, or a 19th century city worker, everyone we've talked about these benefiting has been male, and in that way Amsterdam's system is incredibly outdated. The city has seen protests over the absence of similar accommodations for women, and as of 2020, there are just a few public toilets in town specifically built for women. And, until more of those get built, some of the ones built for men have been equipped with a piece of technology allowing women to pee, standing up. Now, let's make our way over to the Oudekerk. The Oudekerk, or Old Church, is the oldest building in Amsterdam, begun in the early 13th century. Not everything you see is from that time, however. During moments of prosperity, the building has been continually expanded, hence the hodgepodge of styles. And the high times have been enough to make it an impressive building in terms of size, design, and music. The building includes 39 bells and four organs. Inside, though, things are much simpler. Apart from the organs, some beautiful stained glass, and the graves that mark the 10,000 burials in the church floor, you wouldn't see the richness of liturgical art that's typical in churches of this age. That's because of the Dutch Reformation, which turned this from a Catholic church to a Dutch Reformed church in 1578. That's a few years into the Eighty Years' War that separated the Netherlands from Spain. Religious disagreements were part of that war, and the church became a kind of battleground. Riots destroyed much of the art in the building. Speaking to the rioters, though, one might have gotten the impression that they felt they weren't desecrating the space, but purifying it. One of the many breaking points between Catholics and Dutch reformers is over the purpose and the aesthetics of a church. The Dutch Reformation called for simplicity and the stripping away of anything that might distract from the language of the sermon. Now, as we walk along the southern side of the church, there's something quite unexpected that you may not notice, unless you happen to be looking at the ground. This sculpture is an oddity. It's small and maybe mischievous, which could make you think it was placed by someone acting on their own. But on the other hand, it's worked into the cobblestones of a city-maintained street, and it's been here undisturbed since 1993, and it's engineered so as to not be a tripping hazard or to make noise when it's struck. In fact, it's part of a series of sculptures, bronzes by an anonymous artist mostly located in Amsterdam. The official line is that the artist is a medical professional who prefers anonymity, but plenty of theories are out there as to the identity of the real creator, including former Queen Beatrix, who is a sculptor. Now, back to the church. The old church has a distinguished history with art and music. Rembrandt had four of his children christened here, and his wife, Saskia van Aldenburg, is buried inside. Another burial is composer Jan Peterson Svelink, a standout in keyboard and choral music, known for innovation and fugues. There's a bust of him inside the church, and he made his career as the church organist, which is remarkable, given that for Protestant reformers like John Calvin and Martin Luther, one of the favorite symbols of the decadence and materialism of the church they were breaking from 
was pipe organs. Along with saint icons and decorated altars, they signified needless expense, and their wordless music, the argument went, did nothing for a sacred message. In other parts of Europe, a riot that destroyed church art may also have taken the organ down with it, but the Dutch Reformation was a little less fierce about these requirements. Plus, organs in Dutch churches had often been paid for by cities, sometimes by way of taxes that were still strong in the memory of the very citizens stripping the icons from the church. And so the organs tended to survive the riot or the purification, and cities maintained organs and organists at their own expense, even when clergy weren't always fond of the fact. And so this church, almost in spite of itself, became a landmark in the history of organ music and the refuge of one of the great composers on the instrument. Even after the Reformation banned Catholic worship in Amsterdam, Catholics didn't all convert or disappear, and today, of the roughly half of Dutch people who claim any religious affiliation at all, more belong to the Catholic Church than any other. Ultimately, new churches were built, mainly the Basilica of St. Nicholas, located about a five-minute walk north of here. But in the time in between, Catholics met in secret. Soon, we'll see one of the places where they gathered. Our next stop, the Prostitution Information Center, is right behind the church, which initially seems an odd place, but there are actually windows where sex workers ply their trade that look directly at the old church. The Prostitution Information Center is a bit like the Red Light Secrets Museum we saw earlier, a place that offers a calm, humanizing, insider perspective on the real lives of sex workers. In this case, it was founded in 1994 by former sex worker Mariska Major. She's also responsible for the installation of Bell, a statue on the side of the church, not far from the bronze cobblestone, of a woman standing in a doorway, with a caption reading, quote, Respect sex workers all over the world. Compared to the museum, the information center is more directed at the needs of sex workers themselves, and it's the base of operations for the Dutch Sex Workers Union, also founded by Majeure. But it also has a lot to offer visitors. Plenty of people project nervousness as they enter, so they've gone out of their way to give the place an easygoing vibe. There's a cafe atmosphere, there are drinks on offer, and sometimes pie, with some space to sit down and peruse their reading material, which covers subjects from the etiquette of interaction with sex workers to tough questions about human rights. There's also a model room to offer a sense of the spaces Amsterdam sex workers spend their day in. And there's a shop called Die Wallenwinkel, which has books and other educational materials for sale, along with t-shirts, condoms, magnets, and miniatures of Bell. Note that the organization is a non-profit, so anything you spend here goes towards their mission. Special presentations are also held here intermittently. You'll find those and more information on their website linked below. And now to our final stop, Ons Liebe Heer op Solder, or Our Lord in the Attic Museum, which is just around the corner and along the canal. You can see it just up ahead here on the left. Our Lord in the Attic is a museum, a home, and a church, all at the same time. The museum dates from 1888, the home from 1630, and the church from 1663, the year Catholic services were banned. Rather than comply, Catholics went underground, or rather overground, in this case, into an attic. The word attic might give you humble expectations for what waits upstairs. The church occupies not just the attic, but also the top two floors. It's large enough to fit an organ, a living space for the priest, and 150 people. And while the entrance was behind a secret door, it would have been impossible to hide this many people coming and going from the house every Sunday, not to mention the conspicuously missing top two floors. As with soft drugs and sex work in their own eras, Catholicism became a thing that was officially banned by the state but in a way that went unenforced, as long as it was kept inconspicuous. The church is the main attraction of the museum today, but the house is part of it too. It's still furnished as it would have been in the 17th century, when it was the home of a rich merchant. The exhibits introduce a visitor to the daily life of the era, as well as the history of religious freedom in the Netherlands. And so concludes our virtual tour of de Wallen. 
For more ideas of things to do in Amsterdam, including boat and bike tours, live music, free activities, food, and museums, check out our website linked in the notes. Look for our articles and audio tours. Don't forget to like and share, and also check out our YouTube channel featuring myriad other cities too. Thank you for walking with me today. I hope you've enjoyed every step of our journey.